Chapter Seven of By What Authority by Robert Hugh Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Door in the Garden Wall. On the morning of the day after Mr. Stewart's secret arrival at Maxwell House, the rector was walking up and down the lawn that adjoined the churchyard. He had never yet wholly recovered from the sneers of Mistress Corbett. The wounds had healed, but had not ceased to smart how blind these papists were he thought how prejudiced for the old trifling details of worship how ignorant of the vital principles still retained the old realities of god and the faith and the church were with them still in this village he reminded himself it was only the incrustations of error that had been removed of course the transition was difficult and hearts were sore but the eternal god can be patient but then if the discontent of the papists smouldered on one side the fanatical and irresponsible zeal of the puritans flared on the other how difficult he thought to steer the safe middle course how much cool faith and clear-sightedness it needed he reminded himself of Archbishop Parker, who now held the rudder, and comforted himself with the thought of his wise moderation in dealing with excesses, his patient pertinacity among the whirling gusts of passion that enabled him to wait upon events to push his schemes, and his tender knowledge of human nature but in spite of these reassuring facts mr dent was anxious what could even the archbishop do when his suffragans were such poor creatures and when leicester the strongest man at court was a violent puritan partisan the rector would have been content to bear the troubles of his own flock and household if he had been confident of the larger cause but the vagaries of the puritans threatened all with ruin that morning only he had received a long account from a fellow of his own college of corpus christi cambridge and a man of the same views as himself of the violent controversy raging there at that time the professor wrote his friend referring to thomas cartwright is plastering us all with his genevan ways we are all papists it seems he would have neither bishop nor priest nor archbishop nor dean nor archdeacon nor dignitaries at all but just the plain godly minister as he names it or if he has the bishop and the deacon they are to be the episcopos and the diaconos of the scripture and not the papish counterfeits then it seems that the minister is to be made not by god but by man and that the people are to make him not the bishop as if the sheep should make the shepherd then it appears we are papists too for kneeling at the communion this he names a feeble superstition then he would have all men reside in their benefices or vacate them and all that do not so it appears are no better than thieves or robbers and so he rages on breathing out this smoky stuff and all the young men do run after him as if he were the very pillar of fire to lead them to canaan one day he says there shall be no bishop and my lord of ely rides through petty curry with scarce a man found to doff cap and say my lord save foolish papists like myself another day he will have no distinction of apparel and the young sparks straight dress like ministers and the ministers like young sparks on another he likes not saint peter his day and none will go to church he would have us all to be little master calvins if he could have his way with us but the master of trinity has sent a complaint to the council with charges against him and has preached against him too but no word hath yet come from the council and we fear not will be done to the sore injury of christ his holy church and the protestant religion and the triumphing of their pestilent heresies so the caustic divine wrote 
and the rector of great keynes was heavy-hearted as he walked up and down and read everywhere it was the same story the extreme precisians openly flouted the religion of the church of england submitted to episcopal ordination as a legal necessity and then mocked at it refused to wear the prescribed dress and repudiated all other distinctions too in meets and days as judaic remnants denounced all forms of worship except those directly sanctioned by scripture in short they remained in the church of england and drew her pay while they scouted her orders and derided her claims further they cried out as persecuted martyrs whenever it was proposed to insist that they should observe their obligations but worse than all for such conscientious clergymen as mr dent was the fact that bishops preferred such men to livings and at the same time were energetic against the papist party it was not that there was not an abundance of disciplinary machinery ready at the bishop's disposal or that the queen was opposed to coercion rather she was always urging them to insist upon conformity but it seemed rather to such sober men as the rector that the principle of authority had been lost with the rejection of the papacy and that anarchy rather than liberty had prevailed in the national church in darker moments it seemed to him and his friends as if any wild fancy was tolerated so long as it did not approximate too closely to the old religion and they grew sick at heart it was all the more difficult for the rector as he had so little sympathy in the place his wife did all she could to destroy friendly relations between the hall and the rectory and openly derided her husband's prelatical leanings the maxwells themselves disregarded his priestly claims and the villagers thought of him as an official paid to promulgate the new state religion the only house where he found sympathy and help was the dower house and as he paced up and down his garden now his little perplexed determined face grew brighter as he made up his mind to see mr norris again in the afternoon during his meditations he heard and saw indistinctly through the shrubbery that fenced the lawn from the drive a mounted man ride up to the rectory door he supposed it was some message and held himself in readiness to be called into the house but after a minute or two he heard the man ride off again down the drive into the village at dinner he mentioned it to his wife who answered rather shortly that it was a message for her and he let the matter drop for fear of giving offence he was terrified at the thought of provoking more quarrels than were absolutely necessary soon after dinner he put on his cap and gown and to his wife's inquiries told her where he was going and that after he had seen mr norris he would step on down to combers where was a sick body or two and that she might expect him back not earlier than five o'clock she nodded without speaking and he went out she watched him down the drive from the dining-room window and then went back to her business with an odd expression mr norris whom he found already seated at his books again after dinner took him out when he had heard his errand and the two began to walk up and down together on the raised walk that ran along under a line of pines a little way from the house the rector had seldom found his friend more sympathetic and tender he knew very well that their intellectual and doctrinal standpoints were different but he had not come for anything less than spiritual help and that he found he told him all his heart and then waited while the other with his thin hands clasped behind his back and his great gray eyes cast up at the heavy pines and the tender sky beyond began to comfort the minister you are troubled my friend he said and i do not wonder at it by the turbulence of these times on all sides are fightings and fears of course i cannot as you know 
regard these matters you have spoken of episcopacy ceremonies at the communion and the like in the grave light in which you see them but i take it if i understand you rightly that it is the confusion and lack of any authority or respect for antiquity that is troubling you more you feel yourself in a sad plight between these raging waves tossed to and fro battered upon by both sides forsaken and despised and disregarded now indeed although i do not stand quite where you do yet i see how great the stress must be but if i may say so to a minister it is just what you regard as your shame that i regard as your glory it is the mark of the cross that is on your life when our saviour went to his passion he went in the same plight as that in which you go both jew and gentile were against him on this side and that his claims were disallowed his royalty denied he was despised and rejected of men he did not go to his passion as to a splendid triumph bearing his pain like some solemn and mysterious dignity at which the world wondered and was silent but he went battered and spat upon with the sweat and the blood and the spittle running down his face contemned by the contemptible hated by the hateful rejected by the outcast barked upon by the curs and it was that that made his passion so bitter to go to death however painful with honour and applause or at least with the silence of respect were easy it is not hard to die upon a throne but to live on a dunghill with job that is bitterness now again i must protest that i have no right to speak like this to a minister but since you have come to me i must needs say what i think and it is this that some wise man once said fear honour for shame is not far off covet shame for honour is surely to follow if that be true of the philosopher how much more true it is of the christian minister whose profession it is to follow the saviour and to be made like unto him he said much more of the same kind and his soft balmy faith soothed the minister's wounds and braced his will the rector could not help half envying his friend living as it seemed in this still retreat apart from wrangles and controversy with the peaceful music and sweet fragrance of the pines and the love of god about him when he had finished he asked the rector to step indoors with him and there in his own room took down and read to him a few extracts from the german mystics that he thought bore upon his case finally to put him at his ease again for it seemed an odd reversal that he should be coming for comfort to his parishioners mr norris told him about his two children and in turn asked his advice about anthony he said i am not at all anxious i know that the boy fancies himself in love and goes sighing about when he is at home but he sleeps and eats heartily for i have observed him and i think mistress corbett has a good heart and means no harm to him but about my daughter i am less satisfied for i have been watching her closely she is quiet and good and above all she loves the saviour but how do i know that her heart is not bleeding within she has been taught to hold herself in and not to show her feelings and that i think is as much a drawback sometimes as wearing the heart upon the sleeve 
Mr. Dent suggested sending her away for a visit for a month or two. His host mused a moment and then said that he himself had thought of that, and now that his minister said so too, probably, under God, that was what was needed. The fact that Hubert was expected home soon was an additional reason. And he had friends in Northampton, he said, to whom he could send her. They hold strongly by the Genevan theology there, he said, smiling. But I think that will do her no harm, as a balance to the popery at Maxwell Hall. They talked a few minutes more, and when the minister rose to take his leave, Mr. Norris slipped down on his knees as if it was the natural thing to do, and as if the minister were expecting it, and asked his guest to engage in prayer. It was the first time he had ever done so, probably because this talk had brought them nearer together spiritually than ever before. The minister was taken aback, and repeated a collect or two from the prayer book, then they said the lord's prayer together and then mr norris without any affectation engaged in a short extempore prayer asking for light in these dark times and peace in the storm and begged the blessing of god upon the village and upon their shepherd to whom thou hast given to drink of the cup of thy passion and upon his own children and lastly upon himself the chief of sinners and the least of thy servants that is not worthy to be called thy friend it touched mr dent exceedingly and he was yet more touched and reconciled to the incident when his host said simply remaining on his knees with his eyes closed and his clear-cut tranquil face upturned i ask your blessing sir the rector's voice trembled a little as he gave it and then with real gratitude and a good deal of sincere emotion he shook his friend's hand and rustled out from the cool house into the sunlit garden greeting isabel who was walking up and down outside a little pensively and took the field path that led towards the hamlet where his sick folk were expecting him as he walked back about five o'clock towards the village he noticed there was thunder in the air and was aware of a physical oppression but in his heart it was morning and the birds singing. The talk earlier in the afternoon had shown him how, in the midst of the bitterness of the cup, to find the fragrance where the Saviour's lips had rested, and that was joy to him. And again his true pastor's heart had been gladdened by the way his ministrations had been received that afternoon a sour old man who had always scowled at him for an upstart in his foolish old desire to be loyal to the priest who had held the benefits before him had melted at last and asked his pardon and god's for having treated him so ill and he had prepared the old man for death with great contentment to them both and had left him at peace with god and man on looking back on it all afterwards he was convinced that god had thus strengthened him for the trouble that was awaiting him at home he had hardly come into his study when his wife entered with a strange look breathing quick and short she closed the door and stood near it looking at him apprehensively george she said rather sharply and nervously you must not be vexed with me but well he said heavily and the warmth died out of his heart he knew something terrible impended i have done it for the best she said and obstinacy and a kind of impatient tenderness strove in her eyes as she looked at him you must show yourself a man it is not fitting that loose ladies of the court should mock he got up and his eyes were determined too tell me what you have done woman he cried she put out her hand as if to hold him still and her voice rang hard and thin i will say my say she said it is not for that that i have done it but you are a gospel minister and must be faithful the justice is here i sent for him the justice he said blankly but his heart was beating heavily in his throat 
Mr. Franklin from East Grinstead, with a couple of pursuivants and a company of servants. There is a popish agent at the hall, and they are come to take him. The rector swallowed with difficulty once or twice, and then tried to speak, but she went on. And I have promised that you shall take them in by the side door. I will not, he cried. She held up her hand again for silence and glanced round at the door. I have given him the key, she said. This was the private key, possessed by the incumbent for generations past, and Sir Nicholas had not withdrawn it from the Protestant rector. There is no choice, she said. Oh, George, be a man! Then she turned and slipped out. He stood perfectly still for a moment. His pulses were racing. He could not think. He sat down and buried his face in his hands, and gradually his brain cleared and quieted. Then he realized what it meant, and his soul rose in blind, furious resentment. This was the last straw. It was the woman's devilish jealousy. But what could he do? The justice was here. Could he warn his friends? He clenched his fingers into his hair as the situation came out clear and hard before his brain. Dear God, what could he do? There were footsteps in the flagged hall, and he raised his head as the door opened, and a portly gentleman in riding dress came in, followed by Mrs. Dent. The rector rose confusedly, but could not speak and his eyes wandered round to his wife again and again, as she took a chair in the shadow and sat down. But the magistrate noticed nothing. Aha, he said, beaming, you have a wife, sir, that is a jewel. Solomon never spoke a truer word, an ornament to her husband, he said, I think. But you as a minister should know better than I, a mere layman and his face creased with mirth. What did the red-faced fool mean, thought the rector, if only he would not talk so loud. He must think, he must think, what could he do? She was very brisk, sir, the magistrate went on, sitting down, and the rector followed his example, sitting too, with his back to the window, and his hand to his head. Then Mr. Frankland went on with his talk, and the man sat there, still glancing from time to time mechanically towards his wife, who was there in the shadow, with steady white face and hands in her lap, watching the two men. The magistrate's voice seemed to the bewildered man to roll on like a wheel over stones, interminable, grinding, stupefying. What was he saying? What was that about his wife? she had sent to him the day before had she and told him of the popish agent's coming ah a dangerous man was he a spreader of seditious pamphlets at least they supposed he was the man yes yes he understood these fly-by-nights were threateners of the whole commonwealth they must be hunted out like vermin and just so and and he as a minister of the gospel should be the first to assist just so he agreed with all his heart as a minister of the gospel yes but dear lord what was he to do this fat man with the face of a butcher must not be allowed to ah uh, uh, what was that he had missed that would mr franklin be so good as to say it again yes yes he understood now the men were posted already. No one suspected anything. They had come by the bridle path. Every door? Did he understand that every door of the hall was watched? Ah, that was prudent. There was, there was no chance then of anyone sending a warning in? Oh, no, no. He did not dream for a moment that there was any concealed catholic who would be likely to do such a thing but he only wondered <sighs> yes yes the magistrate was right 
one could not be too careful because ah uh, what was that about sir nicholas yes yes indeed he was a good landlord and very popular in the village ah just so it had better be done quietly at the side door yes that was the one which the key fitted but but he thought perhaps he had better not come in because sir nicholas was his friend and there was no use in making bad blood oh not to the house very well then he would come as far as the yew hedge at at what time did the magistrate say at half past eight yes that would be best as mr franklin said because sir nicholas had ordered the horses for nine o'clock so they would come upon them just at the right time how many men did mr franklin say eight oh yes eight and himself and he did not quite follow the plan ah through the yew hedge on to the terrace and through the south door into the hall then if they bolted they surely he had understood the magistrate to say there was only one oh he had not understood that sir nicholas too but why why good god as a harbourer of priests no but this fellow was an agent surely well if the magistrate said so of course he was right but he would have thought himself that sir nicholas might have been left ah oh, well he would say no more he quite saw the magistrate's point now no no he was no favourer god forbid his wife would speak for him as to that marian would bear witness well well he thanked the magistrate for his compliments and would he proceed with the plan by the south door he was saying yes into the hall yes the east room was sir nicholas study or of course they might be supping upstairs but it made no difference no the magistrate was right about that so long as they held the main staircase and had all the other doors watched they were safe to have him no no the cloister wing would not be used they might leave that out of their calculations besides did not the magistrate say that marian had seen the lights in the east wing last night yes yes well that settled it and the signal oh he had not caught that the church bell was it to be but what for why did they need a signal ah uh, he understood for the advance at half past eight just so he would send thomas up to ring it would marian kindly see to that yes indeed his wife was a woman to be proud of such a faithful protestant no patience with these seditious rogues at all well was that all was there anything else yes how dark it was getting it must be close on eight o'clock thomas had gone had he that was all right and had the men everything they wanted well yes although the village did go to bed early it would perhaps be better to have no lights because there was no need to rouse suspicion oh very well perhaps it would be better for mr franklin to go and sit with the men and keep them quiet and his wife would go too just to make sure they had all that they wanted very well yes he would wait here in the dark until he was called not more than a quarter of an hour thank you yes then the door had closed and the man left alone flung himself down in his chair and buried his face again in his arms ah oh, what was to be done nothing 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 and there they were at the hall his neighbours and friends the kind old catholic and his ladies how would he ever dare to meet their eyes again 
but what could be done nothing how far away the afternoon seems that quiet sunny walk beneath the pines his friend is at his books no doubt with the silver candles and the open pages and his own neat manuscript growing under his white scholarly fingers and isabel at her needlework before the fire how peaceful and harmless and sweet it all is and down there not fifty yards away is the village every light out by now and the children and parents too asleep ah what will the news be when they wake to-morrow and that strange talk this afternoon of the saviour and his cup of pain and the squalor and indignity of the passion ah yes he could suffer with jesus on the cross so gladly on that tree of life but not with judas on the tree of death and the minister dropped his face lower over the edge of his desk and the hot tears of misery and self-reproach and impotence began to run there was no help no help anywhere all were against him even his wife herself and his lord then with a moan he lifted his hot face into the dusk jesus he cried in his soul thou knowest all things thou knowest that i love thee there came a tapping on the door and the door opened an inch it is time whispered his wife's voice end of chapter seven chapter eight of by what authority by robert hugh benson this librivox recording is in the public domain the taking of mr stewart they were still sitting over the supper table at the hall the sun had set about the time they had begun and the twilight had deepened into dark but they had not cared to close the shutters as they were to move so soon the four candles shone out through the windows and there still hung a pale glimmer outside owing to the refraction of light from the white stones of the terrace beyond on the left there sloped away a high black wall of impenetrable darkness where the yew hedge stood over that was the starless sky sir nicholas study was bright with candlelight and the lace and jewels of lady maxwell for her sister wore none added a vague pleasant sense of beauty to mr stuart's mind for he was one who often fared coarsely and slept hard he sighed a little to himself as he looked out over this shining supper-table past the genial smiling face of sir nicholas to the dark outside and thought how in less than an hour he would have left the comfort of this house for the grey road and its hardships again it was extraordinarily sweet to him for he was a man of taste and a natural inclination to luxury to stay a day or two now and again at a house like this and mix again with his own equals instead of with the rough company of the village inn or the curious foreign conspirators with their absence of educated perception and their doubtful cleanliness he was a man of domestic instinct and good birth and breeding and would have been perfectly at his ease as the master of some household such as this with a chapel and a library and a pleasant garden and a state spending his days in great leisure and good deeds and instead of all this scarcely by his own choice but by what he would have called his vocation he was partly an exile living from hand to mouth in lodgings and inns and when he was in his own fatherland a hunted fugitive lurking about in unattractive disguises he sighed again once or twice there was silence a moment or two there sounded one note from the church tower a couple of hundred yards away lady maxwell heard it and looked suddenly up she scarcely knew why and caught her sister's eyes glancing at her there was a shade of uneasiness in them it is thundery to-night said sir nicholas mr stuart did not speak lady maxwell looked up quickly at him as he sat on her right facing the window and saw an expression of slight disturbance cross his face 
he was staring out on to the quickly darkening terrace past sir nicholas who with pursed lips and a little frown was stripping off his grapes from the stalk the look of uneasiness deepened and the young man half rose from his chair and sat down again what is it mr stuart said lady maxwell and her voice had a ring of terror in it sir nicholas looked up quickly eh eh he began the young man rose up and recoiled a step still staring out i beg your pardon he said but i have just seen several men pass the window there was a rush of footsteps and a jangle of voices outside in the hall and as the four rose up from table looking at one another there was a rattle at the handle outside the door flew open and a ruddy strongly built man stood there with a slightly apprehensive air and holding a loaded cane a little ostentatiously in his hand the faces of several men looked over his shoulder sir nicholas ruddy face had paled his mouth was half open with dismay and he stared almost unintelligently at the magistrate mr stuart's hand closed on the handle of a knife that lay beside his plate in the queen's name said mr frankland and looked from the knife to the young man's white determined face and down again a little sobbing broke from lady maxwell it is useless sir said the magistrate sir nicholas persuade your guest not to make a useless resistance we are ten to one the house has been watched for hours sir nicholas took a step forward his mouth closed and opened again lady maxwell took a swift rustling step from behind the table and threw her arm round the old man's neck still none of them spoke come in said the magistrate turning a little the men outside filed in to the number of half a dozen and two or three more were left in the hall all were armed mistress margaret who had stood up with the rest sat down again and rested her head on her hand apparently completely at her ease i must beg pardon lady maxwell he went on but my duty leaves me no choice he turned to the young man who on seeing the officers had laid the knife down again and now stood with one hand on the table rather pale but apparently completely self-controlled looking a little disdainfully at the magistrate then sir nicholas made a great effort but his face twitched as he spoke and the hand that he lifted to his wife's arm shook with nervousness and his voice was cracked and unnatural sit down my dear sit down what is all this i do not understand mr franklin sir what do you want of me and who are all these gentlemen won't you sit down mr franklin and take a glass of wine let me make mr stuart known to you and he lifted a shaking hand as if to introduce them the magistrate smiled a little on one side of his mouth it is no use sir nicholas he said this gentleman i fear is well known to some of us already no no sir he cried sharply the window is guarded mr stuart who had looked swiftly and sideways across at the window faced the magistrate again i do not know what you mean sir he said it was a lad who passed the window there was a movement outside in the hall and the magistrate stepped to the door who is there he cried out sharply there was a scuffle and a cry of a boy's voice and a man appeared holding anthony by the arm mistress margaret turned round in her seat and said in a perfectly natural voice why anthony my lad there was a murmur from one or two of the men silence called out the magistrate we will finish the other affair first and he made a motion to hold anthony for a moment now then do any of you men know this gentleman a pursuivant stepped out mr franklin sir i know him under two names mr chapman and mr woad he is a popish agent i saw him in the company of dr story in antwerp four months ago mr stuart blew out his lips sharply and contemptuously pooh he said and then turned to the man and bowed ironically i congratulate you my man he said in a tone of bitter triumph in april i was in france kindly remember this man's words mr franklin they will tell in my favour 
for i presume you mean to take me i will remember them said the magistrate mr stuart bowed to him he had completely regained his composure then he turned to sir nicholas and lady maxwell who had been watching in a bewildered silence i am extremely sorry he said for having brought this annoyance on you lady maxwell but these men are so sharp that they see nothing but guilt everywhere i do not know yet what my crime is but that can wait sir nicholas we should have parted anyhow in half an hour we shall only say good-bye here instead of at the door the magistrate smiled again as before and half put up his hand to hide it i beg your pardon mr chapman but you need not part from sir nicholas yet i fear sir nicholas that i shall have to trouble you to come with us lady maxwell drew a quick hissing breath her sister got up swiftly and went to her as she sat down in sir nicholas chair still holding the old man's hand sir nicholas turned to his guest and his voice broke again and again as he spoke mr stuart he said i am sorry that any guest of mine should be subject to these insults however i am glad that i shall have the pleasure of your company after all i suppose we ride to east grinstead he added harshly to the magistrate who bowed to him then may i have my servant sir presently said mr frankland and then turned to anthony who had been staring wide-eyed at the scene now who is this a man answered from the rank that is master anthony norris sir ah and who is master anthony norris a papist too no sir said the man again a good protestant and the son of mr norris at the dower house ah said the magistrate again judiciously and what might you be wanting here master anthony norris anthony explained that he often came up in the evening and that he wanted nothing the magistrate eyed him a moment or two well i have nothing against you young gentlemen but i cannot let you go till i am safely set out you might rouse the village take him out till we start he added to the man who guarded him come this way sir said the officer and anthony presently found himself sitting on the long oak bench that ran across the western end of the hall at the foot of the stairs and just opposite the door of sir nicholas's room where he had just witnessed that curious startling scene the man who had charge of him stood a little distance off and did not trouble him further and anthony watched in silence the hall was still dark except for one candle that had been lighted by the magistrate's party and it looked sombre and suggestive of tragedy floor walls and ceiling were all dark oak and the corners were full of shadows a streak of light came out of the slightly opened door opposite and a murmur of voices the rest of the house was quiet it had all been arranged and carried out without disturbance anthony had a very fair idea of what was going forward he knew of course that the catholics were always under suspicion and now understood plainly enough from the conversation he had heard that the reddish-haired young man standing so alert and cheerful by the table in there had somehow precipitated matters anthony himself had come up on some trifling errand and had run straight into this affair and now he sat and wondered resentfully with his eyes and ears wide open there were men at all the inner doors now they had slipped in from the outer entrances as soon as word had reached them that the prisoners were secured and only a couple were left outside to prevent the alarm being raised in the village these inner sentinels stood motionless at the foot of the stairs that rose up into the unlighted lobby overhead at the door that led to the inner hall and the servants quarters and at those that led to the cloister wing and the garden respectively the murmur of voices went on in the room opposite and presently a man slipped out and passed through the sentinels to the door leading to the kitchens and pantry he carried a pike in his hand and was armed with a steel cap and breastpiece in a minute or two he had returned followed by mr boyd sir nicholas body servant the two passed into the study and a moment later the dark inner hall was full of moving figures and rustlings and whisperings as the alarmed servants poured up from downstairs then the study door opened again and anthony caught a glimpse of the lighted room the two ladies with sir nicholas and his guest were seated at table there was the figure of an armed man behind mr stuart's chair and another behind lady maxwell's 
then the door closed again as mr boyd with the magistrate and a constable carrying a candle came out this way sir said the servant and the three crossed the hall and passing close by anthony went up the broad oak staircase that led to the upper rooms then the minutes passed away from upstairs came the noise of doors opening and shutting and footsteps passing overhead from the inner hall the sound of low talking and a few sobs now and again from a frightened maid from sir nicholas's room all was quiet except once when mr stewart's laugh high and natural rang out anthony thought of that strong brisk face he had seen in the candlelight and wondered how he could laugh with death so imminent and worse than death and a warmth of admiration and respect glowed at the lad's heart the man by anthony sighed and shifted his feet what is it for whispered the lad at last i mustn't speak to you sir said the man at last the footsteps overhead came to the top of the stairs the magistrate's voice called out sharply and impatiently come along come along and the three all carrying bags and valises came downstairs again and crossed the hall again the door opened as they went in leaving the luggage on the floor and anthony caught another glimpse of the four still seated round the table but sir nicholas head was bowed upon his hands then again the door closed and there was silence once more it was flung open and anthony saw the interior of the room plainly the four were standing up mr stuart was bowing to lady maxwell the magistrate stood close beside him then a couple of men stepped up to the young man's side as he turned away and the three came out into the hall and stood waiting by the little heap of luggage mr frankland came next with the manservant close beside him and the rest of the men behind and the last closed the door and stood by it there was a dead silence anthony sprang to his feet in uncontrollable excitement what was happening again the door opened and the men made room as mistress margaret came out and the door shut she came swiftly across with her little air of dignity and confidence towards anthony who was standing forward why master anthony she said dear lad i did not know they had kept you and she took his hand what is it what is it he whispered sharply hush she said and the two stood together in silence the moments passed anthony could hear the quick thumping beat of his own heart and the breathing of mistress margaret but the hall was perfectly quiet where the magistrate with the prisoner and his men stood in an irregular dark group with the candle behind them and no sound came from the room beyond then the handle turned and a crack of light showed but no further sound then the door opened wide a flood of light poured out and sir nicholas tottered into the hall margaret margaret he cried where are you go to her there was a strange moaning sound from the brightly lighted room the old lady dropped anthony's hand and moved swiftly and unfalteringly across and once more the door closed behind her there was a sharp word of command from the magistrate and the sentries from every door left their posts and joined the group which with sir nicholas and his guest and mr boyd in the centre now passed out through the garden door the magistrate paused as he saw anthony standing there alone i can trust you young gentlemen he said not to give the alarm till we are gone anthony nodded and the magistrate passed briskly out onto the terrace shutting the door behind him there was a rush of footsteps and a murmur of voices and the hall was filled with the watching servants as the chorus of exclamations and inquiries broke out anthony ran straight through the crowd to the garden door and on to the terrace they had gone to the left he supposed but he hesitated a moment to listen then he heard the stamp of horses feet and the jingle of saddlery and saw the glare of torches through the yew hedge and he turned quickly and ran along the terrace past the flood of light that poured out from the supper room and down the path that led to the side door opposite the rectory it was very dark and he stumbled once or twice then he came to the two or three stairs that led down to the door in the wall and turned off among the bushes creeping on hands and feet till he reached the wall low on this side but deep on the other and looked over the pursuivants with their men had formed a circle round the two prisoners who were already mounted and who sat looking about them as the luggage was being strapped to their saddles before and behind 
the bridles were lifted forward over the horse's heads and a couple of the guard held each rein the groom who had brought round the two horses for mr stuart and himself stood white-faced and staring with his back to the rectory wall the magistrate was just mounting at a little distance his own horse which was held by the rectory boy mr boyd it seemed was to walk with the men two or three torches were burning by now and every detail was distinct to anthony as he crouched among the dry leaves and peered down on to the group just beneath sir nicholas face was turned away from him but his head was sunk on his breast and he did not stir or lift it as his horse stamped at the strapping on of the valise mr boyd had packed for him mr stuart sat erect and motionless and his face as anthony saw it was confident and fearless then suddenly the door in the rectory wall opposite was flung open and a figure in flying black skirts but hatless rushed out and threw the guard straight up to the old man's knee there was a shout from the men and a movement to pull him off but the magistrate who was on his horse and just outside the circle spoke sharply and the men fell back oh sir nicholas sir nicholas sobbed the minister his face half buried in the saddle anthony saw his shoulders shaking and his hands clutching at the old man's knee forgive me forgive me there was no answer from sir nicholas he still sat unmoved his chin on his breast as the rector sobbed and moaned at his stirrup there there said the magistrate decidedly over the heads of the guard that is enough mr dent and he made a motion with his hand a couple of men took the minister by the shoulders and drew him still crying out to sir nicholas outside the group and he stood there dazed and groping with his hands there was a word of command and the guard moved off at a sharp walk with the horses in the centre and as they turned the lad saw in the torchlight the old man's face drawn and wrinkled with sorrow and great tears running down it the rector leaned against his own wall with his hands over his face and anthony looked at him with growing suspicion and terror as the flare of the torches on the trees faded and the noise of the troop died away round the corner End of chapter 8chapter nine of by what authority by robert hugh benson this librivox recording is in the public domain village justice the village had never known such an awakening as on the morning that followed sir nicholas arrest before seven o'clock every house knew it and children ran half-dressed to the outlying hamlets to tell the story very little work was done that day for the estate was disorganized and the men had little heart for work and there were groups all day on the green which formed and reformed and drifted here and there and discussed and sifted the evidence it was soon known that the rectory household had had a foremost hand in the affair the groom who had been present at the actual departure of the prisoners had told the story of the black figure that ran out of the door and of what was cried at the old man's knee and how he had not moved nor spoken in answer and thomas the rectory boy was stopped as he went across the green in the evening and threatened and encouraged until he told of the stroke on the church bell and the rectory key and the little company that had sat all the afternoon in the kitchen over their ale he told too how a couple of hours ago he had been sent across with a note to lady maxwell and that it had been returned immediately unopened so as night fell indignation had begun to smoulder fiercely against the minister who had not been seen all day and after dark had fallen the name judas was cried in at the rectory door half a dozen times and a stone or two from the direction of the churchyard had crashed on the tiles of the house mr norris had been up all day at the hall but he was the only visitor admitted all day long the gatehouse was kept closed and the same message was given to the few horsemen and carriages that came to inquire after the truth of the report from the catholic houses round to the effect that it was true that sir nicholas and a friend had been taken off to london by the justice from east grinstead and that lady maxwell begged the prayers of her friends 
for her husband's safe return. Anthony had ridden off early with a servant at his father's wish to follow Sir Nicholas and learn any news of him that was possible, to do him any service he was able, and to return or send a message the next day down to Great Keynes and early in the afternoon he returned with the information that sir nicholas was at the marshalsea that he was well and happy that he sent his wife his dear love and that she should have a letter from him before nightfall he rode straight to the hall with the news full of chastened delight at his official importance just pausing to tell a group that was gathered on the green that all was well so far and was shown up to lady maxwell's own parlour where he found her very quiet and self-controlled and extremely grateful for his kindness and riding up to london and back on her account anthony explained too that he had been able to get sir nicholas one or two comforts that the prison did not provide a pillow and an extra coverlet and some fruit and he left her full of gratitude his father had been up to see the ladies two or three times and in spite of the difference in religion had prayed with them and talked a little and lady maxwell had asked that isabel might come up to supper and spend the evening mr norris promised to send her up and then added i am a little anxious lady maxwell lest the people may show their anger against the rector or his wife about what has happened lady maxwell looked startled they have been speaking of it all day long he said they know everything and it seems the rector is not so much to blame as his wife it was she who sent for the magistrate and gave him the key and arranged it all he was only brought into it too late to interfere or refuse have you seen him asked the old lady i have been both days he said but he will not see me he is in his study locked in i may have treated him harshly she said i would not open his note but at least he consented to help them against his friend and her old eyes filled with tears i fear that is so said the other sadly but speak to the people she said i think they love my husband and would do nothing to grieve us tell them that nothing would pain either of us more than that any should suffer for this tell them they must do nothing but be patient and pray there was a group still on the green near the pond as isabel came up to supper that evening about six o'clock her father who had given lady maxwell's message to the people an hour or two before had asked her to go that way and send down a message to him immediately if there seemed to be any disturbance or threatening of it but the men were very quiet mr musgrave was there she saw sitting with his pipe on the stocks and piers the young irish bailiff was standing near they were all silent as the girl came up and saluted her respectfully as usual and she saw no signs of any dangerous element there were one or two older women with the men and others were standing at their open doors on all sides as she went up the rectory gate was locked and no one was to be seen within supper was laid in sir nicholas room as it generally was and as it had been two nights ago and it was very strange to isabel to know that it was here that the arrest had taken place the floor too she noticed as she came in all about the threshold was scratched and dented by rough boots lady maxwell was very silent and distracted during supper she made efforts to talk again and again and her sister did her best to interest her and keep her talking but she always relapsed after a minute or two into silence again with long glances round the room at the vernicle over the fireplace the prie-dieu with the shield of the five wounds above it and all the things that spoke so keenly of her husband what a strange room it was too thought isabel with its odd mingling of the two worlds with the tapestry of the hawking scene 
and the stiff herons and the ladies on horseback on one side and the little shelf of devotional books on the other and yet how characteristic of its owner who fingered his crossbow or the reins of his horse all day and his beads in the evening and how strange that an old man like sir nicholas who knew the world and had as much sense apparently as any one else should be willing to sacrifice home and property and even life itself for these so plainly empty superstitious things that could not please a god that was spirit and truth so isabel thought to herself with no bitterness or contempt but just a simple wonder and amazement as she looked at the painted tokens and trinkets it was still daylight when they went upstairs to lady maxwell's room about seven but the clear southern sky over the yew hedges and the tall elms where the rooks were circling was beginning to be flushed with deep amber and rose isabel sat down in the window seat with the sweet air pouring in and looked out on to the garden with its tiled paths and its cool green squares of lawn and the glowing beds at the sides over to her right the cloister court ran out with its two rows of windows bedrooms above with galleries beyond as she knew and parlours and cloisters below the pleasant tinkle of the fountain in the court came faintly to her ears across the caw of the rooks about the elms and the low sounds from the stables and the kitchen behind the house otherwise the evening was very still the two old ladies were sitting near the fireplace lady maxwell had taken up her embroidery and was looking at it listlessly and mistress margaret had one of her devotional books and was turning the pages pausing here and there as she did so presently she began to read without a word of introduction one of the musings of the old monk john audley in his sickness and as the tender lines stepped on that restless jewelled hand grew still as i lay sick in my languor in an abbey here by west this book i made with great dolor when i might not sleep nor rest oft with my prayers my soul i blessed and said aloud to heaven's king i know o lord it is the best meekly to take thy visiting else well i wot that i were lorn high above all lords be he blessed all that thou dost is for the best by fault of thee was no man lost that is here of woman born and then she read some of rolla's verses to jesus the friend of all sick and sorrowful souls and a meditation of his on the passion and the tranquil thoughts and tender fragrant sorrows soothed the torn throbbing soul and isabel saw the old wrinkled hand rise to her forehead and the embroidery with the needle still in it slip to the ground as the holy name like ointment poured forth gradually brought its endless miracle and made all sweet and healthful again outside the daylight was fading the luminous vault overhead was deepening to a glowing blue as the sunset contracted on the western horizon to a few vivid streaks of glory the room was growing darker every moment and mistress margaret's voice began to stumble over words the great gilt harp in the corner only gleamed here and there now in single lines of clear gold where the dying daylight fell on the strings the room was full of shadows and the image of the holy mother and child had darkened into obscurity in their niche the world was silent now too the rooks were gone home and the stir of the household below had ceased and in a moment more mistress margaret's voice had ceased too as she laid the book down then as if the world outside had waited for silence before speaking there came a murmur of sound from the further side of the house isabel started up surely there was anger in that low roar from the village was it this that her father had feared 
had she been remiss lady maxwell too sprang up and faced the window with wide large eyes the letter she said and took a quick step towards the door but mistress margaret was with her instantly with her arm about her sit down mary she said they will bring it at once and her sister obeyed and she sat waiting and looking towards the door clasping and unclasping her hands as they lay on her lap and mistress margaret stood by her waiting and watching too isabel still stood by the window listening had she been mistaken then the roar had sunk into silence for a moment and there came back the quick beat of a horse's hoofs outside on the short drive between the gatehouse and the hall they were right then and even as she thought it and as the wife that waited for news of her husband drew a quick breath and half rose in her seat at the sound of that shod messenger that bore them again the roar swelled up louder than ever and isabel sprang down from the low step of the window seat into the dusky room where the two sisters waited what is that what is that she whispered sharply there was a sound of opening doors and of feet that ran in the house below and lady maxwell rose up and put out her hand as a manservant dashed in with a letter my lady he said panting and giving it to her they are attacking the rectory lady maxwell who was halfway to the window now for light to read her husband's letter paused at that the rectory she said why margaret then she stopped and isabel close beside her saw her turn resolutely from the great sealed letter in her hand to the door and back again jervis told us my lady none saw him as he rode through they were breaking down the gate then lady maxwell with a quick movement lifted the letter to her lips and kissed it and thrust it down somewhere out of sight in the folds of her dress come margaret she said isabel followed them down the stairs and out through the hall door and there as they came out on to the steps that savage snarling roar swelled up from the green there was laughter and hooting mixed with that growl of anger but even the laughter was fierce the gatehouse stood up black against the glare of torches and the towers threw great swinging shadows on the ground and the steps of the hall isabel followed the two grey glimmering figures and was astonished at the speed with which she had to go the hoofs of the courier's horse rang on the cobbles of the stable-yard as they came down towards the gatehouse and the two wings of the door were wide open through which he had passed just now but the porter was gone ah there was the crowd but not at the rectory on the right the rectory gate lay wide open and a flood of light poured out from the house door at the end of the drive before them lay the dark turf swarming with black figures towards the lower end and a ceaseless roar came from them there were half a dozen torches down there tossing to and fro isabel saw that the crowd was still moving down towards the stocks and the pond now the two ladies in front of her were just coming up with the skirts of the crowd and there was an exclamation or two of astonishment as the women and children saw who it was that was coming then there came the furious scream of a man and the crowd parted as three men came reeling out together two of them trying with all their power to restrain a fighting kicking plunging man in long black skirts who tore and beat with his hands the three ladies stopped for a moment close together and simultaneously the struggling man broke free and dashed back into the crowd screaming with anger and misery marion marion i am coming oh god and isabel saw with a shock of horror that sent her crouching and clinging close to mistress margaret that it was the rector but the two men were after him and caught him by the shoulders as he disappeared and as they turned they faced lady maxwell my lady uh, uh, my lady stammered one we mean him no harm we but his voice stopped as there came a sudden silence rent by a high terrible shriek and a splash followed in a moment by a yell of laughter and shouting 
and lady maxwell threw herself into the crowd in front there were a few moments of jostling in the dark with the reek and press of the crowd about her and isabel found herself on the brink of the black pond with lady maxwell on one side and piers on the other keeping the crowd back and a dripping figure moaning and sobbing in the trampled mud at lady maxwell's feet there was silence enough now and the ring of faces opposite stared astonished and open-mouthed at the tall old lady with her grey veiled head upraised as she stood there in the torchlight and rated them in her fearless indignant voice i am ashamed ashamed cried lady maxwell i thought you were men i thought you loved my husband and and me her voice broke and then once more she cried again i am ashamed ashamed of my village and then she stooped to that heaving figure that had crawled up and laid hold tenderly of the arms that were writhed about her feet come home my dear isabel heard her whisper it was a strange procession homeward up the trampled turf the crowd had broken into groups and the people were awed and silent as they watched the four women go back together isabel walked a little behind with her father and anthony who had at last been able to come forward through the press and join them and a couple of the torch-bearers escorted them in front were the three on one side lady maxwell her lace and silk splashed and spattered with mud and her white hands black with it and on the other the old nun each with an arm thrown round the woman in the centre who staggered and sobbed and leaned against them as she went with her long hair and her draggled clothes streaming with liquid mud every step she took once they stopped at a group of three men the rector was sitting up in his torn dusty cassock and isabel saw that one of his buckled shoes was gone as he sat on the grass with his feet before him but quiet now with his hands before him and a dazed stupid look in his little black eyes that blinked at the light of the torch that was held over him he said nothing as he looked at his wife between the two ladies but his lips moved and his eyes wandered for a moment to lady maxwell's face and then back to his wife take him home presently she said to the men who were with him and then passed on again as they got through the gatehouse isabel stepped forward to mistress margaret's side shall i come she whispered and the nun shook her head so she with her father and brother stood there to watch with the crowd silent and ashamed behind the two torch-bearers went on and stood by the steps as the three ladies ascended leaving black footmarks as they went the door was open and faces of servants peeped out and hands were thrust out to take the burden from their mistress but she shook her head and the three came in together and the door closed as the norrises went back silently the rector passed them with a little group accompanying him too he too could hardly walk alone so exhausted was he with his furious struggles to rescue his wife take your sister home said mr norris to anthony and they saw him slip off and pass his arm through the rector's and bend down his handsome kindly face to the minister's staring eyes and moving lips as he too led him homewards even anthony was hushed and impressed and hardly spoke a word until he and isabel turned off down the little dark lane to the dower house we could do nothing he said father and i until lady maxwell came no said isabel softly she only could have done it End of chapter nine Chapter Ten of By What Authority by Robert Hugh Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Confessor. Sir Nicholas and the party were lodged at East Grinstead the night of their arrest in the magistrate's house. Although he was allowed privacy in his room after he had given his word of honor not to attempt an escape, yet he was allowed no conversation with Mr. Stuart or his own servant except in the presence of the magistrate or one of the pursuivants 
and mr stuart since he was personally unknown to the magistrate and since the charge against him was graver was not on any account allowed to be alone for a moment even in the room in which he slept the following day they all rode on to london and the two prisoners were lodged in the marshalsea this had been for a long while the place where bishop bonner was confined and where catholic prisoners were often sent immediately after their arrest and sir nicholas at any rate found to his joy that he had several old friends among the prisoners he was confined in a separate room but by the kindness of his jailer whom he bribed profusely as the custom was through his servant he had many opportunities of meeting the others and even of approaching the sacraments and hearing mass now and then he began a letter to his wife on the day of his arrival and finished it the next day which was saturday and it was taken down immediately by the courier who had heard the news and called at the prison in fact he was allowed a good deal of liberty although he was watched and his conversation listened to a good deal more than he was aware mr stuart however as he still called himself was in a much harder case the saddlebags had been opened on his arrival and incriminating documents found besides the popish trinkets they were found to contain a number of seditious pamphlets printed abroad for distribution in england for at this time the college at douay under its founder dr william allen late principal of st mary's hall oxford was active in the production of literature these were chiefly commentaries on the bull as well as exhortations to the catholics to stand firm and to persevere in recusancy and to the schismatic catholics as they were called to give over attending the services in the parish churches there were letters also from dr story himself whom the authorities already had in person under lock and key at the tower these were quite sufficient to make mr stuart a prize and he also was very shortly afterwards removed to the tower sir nicholas wrote a letter at least once a week to his wife but writing was something of a labour to him it was exceedingly doubtful to his mind whether his letters were not opened and read before being handed to the courier and as his seal was taken from him his wife could not tell either however they seemed to arrive regularly plainly therefore the authorities were either satisfied with their contents or else did not think them worth opening or suppressing he was quite peremptory that his wife should not come up to london it would only increase his distress he said he liked to think of her at maxwell hall there were other reasons too that he was prudent enough not to commit to paper and which she was prudent enough to guess at the principle of which was of course that she ought to be there for the entertaining and helping of other agents or priests who might be in need of shelter the old man got into good spirits again very soon it pleased him to think that god had honoured him by imprisonment and he said as much once or twice in his letters to his wife he was also pleased with the sense of the part he was playing in the role of a conspirator and he underlined and put signs and exclamation marks all over his letters of which he thought his wife would understand the significance but no one else whereas in reality the old lady was sorely puzzled by them and the authorities who opened the letters generally read them of course like a printed book one morning about ten days after his arrival the governor of the prison looked in with the jailer and announced to sir nicholas after greeting him that he was to appear before the council that very day this of course was what sir nicholas desired and he thanked the governor cordially for his good news they will probably keep you at the tower sir nicholas said the governor and we shall lose you however sir i hope you will be more comfortable there than we have been able to make you the knight thanked the governor again and said good day to him with great warmth for they had been on the best of terms with one another during his short detention at the marshalsea the following day sir nicholas wrote a long letter to his wife describing his examination we are in royal lodgings here at last sweetheart mr boyd brought my luggage over yesterday and i am settled for the present 
in a room of my own in the white tower with the prospect over the court i was had before my lords yesterday in the council room we drove hither from the marshalsea there was a bay window in the room i promise you they got little enough from me there was my namesake sir nicholas bacon my lords leicester and pembroke and mr secretary cecil sir james crofts the controller of the household and one or two more but these were the principal i was set before the table on a chair alone with none to guard me but with men at the doors i knew very well my lords were very courteous to me though they laughed more than was seemly at such grave times they questioned me much as to my religion was i a papist if they meant by that a catholic that i was and thanked god for it every day those nicknames like me not was i then a recusant if by that they meant did i go to their genevan hotchpotch that i did not nor never would i thought to have said a word here about saint cyprian his work de unitate ecclesiae as f dash r x told me but they would not let me speak did i know mr chapman if by that they meant mr stuart that i did and for a courteous god-fearing gentleman too was he a papist or a catholic if i would have it so that i would not tell them let them find that out with their pursuivants and that crew did i think protestants to be fearers of god that i did not they feared not but the queen's majesty so it seemed to me then they all laughed at once i know not why then they grew grave and mr secretary began to ask me questions sharp and hard but i would not be put upon and answered him again as he asked did i know aught of dr story nothing said i save that he is a good catholic and that they had taken him he is a seditious rogue said my lord pembroke that he is not said i then they asked me what i thought of the pope and his bull and whether he can depose princes i said i thought him to be the vicar of christ and as to his power to depose princes that i supposed he could do if he said so then two or three cried out on me that i had not answered honestly and at that i got wrath and then they laughed again at least i saw sir james crofts at it and mr secretary looking very hard at me asked whether if philip sent an armament against elizabeth to depose her i would fight for him or her grace for neither said i i am too old for which then would you pray said they for the queen's grace said i for that she was my sovereign this seemed to content them and they talked a little among themselves they had asked me other questions too as to my way of living whether i went to mass they asked me too a little more about mr stuart did i know him to be a seditious rascal that i did not said i then how asked they did you come to receive him and his pamphlets of his pamphlets said i i know nothing i saw nothing in his bags save beads and a few holy books and such things you see sweetheart i did him no injury by saying so because i knew that they had his bags themselves and i said i had received him because he was recommended to me by some good friends of mine abroad and i told them their names too for they are safe in flanders now and when they had done their questions they talked again for a while and i was sent out to the antechamber to refresh myself and mr secretary sent a man to me to see that i had all i needed and we talked together a little and he said the council were in good humour at the taking of dr story and he had never seen them so merry then i was had back again presently and mr secretary said i was to stay in the tower and that mr boyd was gone already to bring my things and so after that i went by water to the tower and here i am sweetheart well and cheerful praise god my dearest i send you my heart's best love 
God have you in his holy keeping. The council treated the old knight very tenderly. They were shrewd enough to see his character very plainly, and that he was a simple man who knew nothing of sedition, but only had harboured agents, thinking them to be as guileless as himself. As a matter of fact, Mr. Stewart was an agent of Dr. Storey's, and was therefore implicated in a number of very grave charges. This, of course, was a very serious matter. But both in the examination of the council and in papers in Mr. Stewart's bags, nothing could be found to implicate Sir Nicholas in any political intrigue at all. The authorities were unwilling, too, to put such a man to the torture. There was always a possibility of public resentment against the torture of a man for his religion alone, and they were desirous not to arouse this, since they had many prisoners who would be more productive subjects of the rack than a plainly simple and loyal old man whose only crime was his religion. They determined, however, to make an attempt to get a little more out of Sir Nicholas by a device which would excite no resentment, if it ever transpired, and one which was more suited to the old man's nature and years. Sir Nicholas thus described it to his wife. Last night, my dearest, I had a great honour and consolation. I was awakened suddenly towards two o'clock in the morning by the door of my room opening and a man coming in. It was somewhat dark, and I could not see the man plainly, but I could see that he limped and walked with a stick, and he breathed hard as he entered. I sat up and demanded of him who he was and what he wanted, and telling me to be still, he said that he was Dr. Storey. You may be sure, sweetheart, that I sprang up at that, but he would not let me rise, and himself sat down beside me. He said that, by the kindness of a jailer, he had been allowed to come, and that he must not stay with me long, that he had heard of me from his good friend, Mr. Stewart. I asked him how he did, for I heard that he had been racked, and he said, yes, it was true but that by the mercy of God and the prayers of the saints he had held his peace and they knew nothing from him. Then he asked me a great number of questions about the men I had entertained and where they were now, and he knew many of their names. Some of them were friends of his own, he said, especially the priests. We talked a good while, till the morning light began, and then he said he must be gone or the head jailer would know of his visit, and so he went. I wish I could have seen his face, sweetheart, for I think him a great servant of God. But it was still too dark when he went, and we dared not have a light, for fear it should be seen. This was, as a matter of fact, a ruse of the authorities. It was not Dr. Storey at all who was admitted to Sir Nicholas' prison, but Parker, who had betrayed him at Antwerp. It was so successful, for Sir Nicholas told him all that he knew, which was really nothing at all, that it was repeated a few months later with richer results, when the conspirator Bailey, hysterical and almost beside himself with the pain of the rack, under similar circumstances, gave up a cipher which was necessary to the council in dealing with the correspondence of Mary Stuart. However, Sir Nicholas never knew the deception, and to the end of his days was proud that he had actually met the famous Dr. Storey when they were both imprisoned in the tower together, and told his friends of it with reverent pride when the doctor was hanged a year later. Hubert, who had been sent for to take charge of the estate, had come to London soon after his father's arrival at the tower, and was allowed an interview with him in the presence of the lieutenant. Hubert was greatly affected. Though he could not look upon the imprisonment with the same solemn exultation as that which his father had, but it made a real impression upon him to find that he took so patiently this separation from home and family for the sake of religion. Hubert received instructions from Sir Nicholas as to the management of the estate for it was becoming plain that his father would have to remain in the tower for the present, not any longer on a really grave charge, but chiefly because he was an obstinate recusant. 
and would promise nothing the law and its administration at this time were very far apart the authorities were not very anxious to search out and punish those who were merely recusants or refused to take the oath of supremacy and so hubert and mr boyd and other catholics were able to come and go under the very nose of justice without any real risk to themselves but it was another matter to let a sturdy recusant go from prison who stoutly refused to give any sort of promise or understanding as to future behaviour sir nicholas was had down more than once to further examinations before the lord's commissioners in the lieutenant's house but it was a very tame and even an amusing affair for all save sir nicholas it was so easy to provoke him he was so simple and passionate that they could get almost anything they wanted out of him by a little adroit baiting and more than once his examination formed a welcome and humorous entr'acte between two real tragedies sir nicholas of course never suspected for a moment that he was affording any amusement to any one he thought their weary laughter to be sardonic and ironical and he looked upon himself as a very desperate fellow indeed and wrote glowing accounts of it all to his wife full of apostrophic praises to god and the saints in a hand that shook with excitement and awe at the thought of the important scenes in which he played so prominent a part but there was no atmosphere of humour about mr stuart he had disappeared from sir nicholas sight on their arrival at the marshalsea and they had not set eyes on one another since nor could all the knight's persuasion and offer of bribes make his jailer consent to take any message or scrap of paper between them he would not even answer more than the simplest inquiries about him that he was alive and in the tower and so forth and sir nicholas prayed often and earnestly for that deliberate and vivacious young man who had so charmed and interested them all down at great keynes and who had been so mysteriously engulfed by the sombre majesty of the law i fear he wrote to lady maxwell i fear that our friend must be sick or dying but i can hear no news of him when i am allowed sometimes to walk in the court or on the leads he is never there my attendant mr jakes looks glum and says nothing when i ask him how my friend does my dearest do not forget him in your prayers nor your old loving husband either one evening late in october mr jakes did not come as usual to bring sir nicholas his supper at five o'clock the time passed and still he did not come this was very unusual presently mrs jakes appeared instead carrying the food which she set down at the door while she turned the key behind her sir nicholas rallied her on having turned jailer but she turned on him a face with red eyes and lined with weeping oh sir nicholas she said for these two were good friends what a wicked place this is god forgive me for saying so but they've had that young man down there since two o'clock and jakes is with them to help and he told me to come up to you sir nicholas with your supper if they weren't done by five and if the young gentleman hadn't said what they wanted sir nicholas felt sick who is it he asked why who but mr stuart she said and then fell weeping again and went out forgetting to lock the door behind her in her grief sir nicholas sat still a moment sick and shaken he knew what it meant but it had never come so close to him before he got up presently and went to the door to listen for he knew not what but there was no sound but the moan of the wind up the draughty staircase and the sound of a prisoner singing somewhere above him a snatch of a song he looked out presently but there was nothing but the dark well of the staircase disappearing round to the left and the glimmer of an oil lamp somewhere from the depths below him with wavering shadows as the light was blown about by the gusts that came up from outside 
There was nothing to be done, of course. He closed the door, went back, and prayed with all his might for the young man who was somewhere in this huge building in his agony. Mr. Jakes came up himself within half an hour to see if all was well, but said nothing of his dreadful employment or of Mr. Stewart, and Sir Nicholas did not like to ask for fear of getting Mrs. Jakes into trouble. The jailer took away the supper things, wished him good night, went out and locked the door, apparently without noticing it had been left undone before. Possibly his mind was too much occupied with what he had been seeing and doing. And the faithful account of all this went down in due time to Great Keynes. The arrival of the courier at the hall on Wednesday and Saturday was a great affair, both to the household and to the village. Sir Nicholas sent his letter generally by the Saturday courier, and the other brought a kind of bulletin from Mr. Boyd, with sometimes a message or two from his master. These letters were taken by the ladies first to the study, as if to an oratory, and Lady Maxwell would read them slowly over to her sister, and in the evening, when Isabel generally came up for an hour or two, the girl would be asked to read them slowly all over again to the two ladies who sat over their embroidery on either side of her, and who interrupted for the sheer joy of prolonging it, and they would discuss together the exact significance of all his marks of emphasis and irony, and the girl would have all she could do sometimes not to feel a disloyal amusement at the transparency of the devices and the simplicity of the loving hearts that marveled at the writer's depth and ingenuity but she was none the less deeply impressed by his courageous cheerfulness and by the power of a religion that in spite of its obvious weaknesses and improbabilities yet inspired an old man like sir nicholas with so much fortitude at first too a kind of bulletin was always issued on the sunday and thursday mornings and nailed upon the outside of the gatehouse so that any who pleased could come there and get first-hand information and an interpreter stood there sometimes one of the younger sons of mr piers and read out to the groups from lady maxwell's sprawling old handwriting news of the master sir nicholas has been had before the council he read out one day in a high complacent voice to the awed listeners and has been sent to the tower of london this caused consternation in the village as it was supposed by the country folk not without excuse that the tower was the antechamber of death but confidence was restored by the further announcement a few lines down that he was well and cheerful great interest too was aroused by more domestic matters sir nicholas it was proclaimed is in a little separate chamber of his own mr jakes his jailer seems an honest fellow sir nicholas hath a little mattress from a friend that mr boyd fetched for him he has dinner at eleven and supper at five sir nicholas hopes that all are well in the village but other changes had followed the old knight's arrest the furious indignation in the village against the part that the rectory had played in the matter made it impossible for the dents to remain there that the minister's wife should have been publicly ducked and that not by a few blackguards but by the solid fathers and sons with the applause of the wives and daughters made her husband's position intolerable and further evidence was forthcoming in the behaviour of the people towards the rector himself some boys had guffawed during his sermon on the following sunday when he had ventured on a word or two of penitence as to his share in the matter and he was shouted after on his way home mrs dent seemed strangely changed and broken during her stay at the hall she had received a terrible shock and it was not safe to move her back to her own house for the first two or three nights she would start from sleep again and again screaming for help and mercy 
and nothing would quiet her till she was wide awake and saw in the firelight the curtained windows in the bolted door and the kindly face of an old servant or mistress margaret with her beads in her hand isabel who came up to see her two or three times was both startled and affected by the change in her and by the extraordinary mood of humility which seemed to have taken possession of the hard self-righteous puritan i begged pardon she whispered to the girl one evening sitting up in bed and staring at her with wide hard eyes i begged pardon of lady maxwell though i am not fit to speak to her do you think she can ever forgive me do you think she can it was i you know who wrought all the mischief as i have wrought all the mischief in the village all these years <laughs> she said she did and she kissed me and said that our saviour had forgiven her much more but but do you think she has forgiven me and then again another night a day or two before they left the place she spoke to isabel again look after the poor bodies she said teach them a little charity i have taught them naught but bitterness and malice so they have but given me my own back again i have reaped what i have sown so the dents slipped off early one morning before the folk were up and by the following sunday young mr botter of whom the bishop entertained a high opinion occupied a little desk outside the chancel arch and great keynes once more had to thank god and the diocesan that it possessed a proper minister of its own and not a mere unordained reader which was all that many parishes could obtain towards the end of september further hints began to arrive very much underlined in the knight's letters of mr stuart and his sufferings you remember our friend isabel read out one saturday evening not mr stuart this puzzled the old lady sorely till isabel explained their lord's artfulness my dearest i fear the worst for him i do not mean apostasy thank god but i fear that these wolves have torn him sadly in their dens then followed the story of mrs jakes with all its horror all the greater from the obscurity of the details isabel put the paper down trembling as she sat on the rug before the fire in the parlour upstairs and thought of the bright-eyed red-haired man with his steady mouth and low laugh whom anthony had described to her lady maxwell posted upon the gatehouse sir nicholas fears that a friend is in sore trouble he hopes he may not yield then after a few days more a brief notice with a black line drawn round it that ran in mr botter's despite our friend has passed away pray for his soul sir nicholas had written in great agitation to this effect my sweetheart i have heavy news to-day there was a great company of folks below my window to-day in the inner ward where the road runs up below the bloody tower it was about nine of the clock and there was a horse there whose head i could see and presently from the beauchamp tower came as i thought an old man between two warders and then i could not very well see the men were in my way but soon the horse went off and the men after him and i could hear the groaning of the crowd that were waiting for them outside and when mr jakes brought me my dinner at eleven at the clock he told me it was our friend think of it my dearest him whom i thought an old man that had been taken off to tyburn and now i need say no more but bid you pray for his soul isabel could hardly finish reading it for she heard a quick sobbing breath behind her and felt a wrinkled old hand caressing her hair and cheek as her voice faltered meanwhile hubert was in town sir nicholas had at first intended him to go down at once and take charge of the estate but piers was very competent and so his father consented that he should remain in london until the beginning of october and this too better suited mr norris's plans who wished 
to send Isabel off about the same time to Northampton. When Hubert at last did arrive, he soon showed himself extremely capable and apt for the work. He was out on the estate from morning till night on his cob, and there was not a man under him, from peers downwards, who had anything but praise for his insight and industry. There was in Hubert, too, as there so often is in country boys, who love and understand the life of the woods and fields, a balancing quality of a deep vein of sentiment, and this was now consecrated to Isabel Norris. He had pleasant dreams as he rode home in the autumn evening under the sweet keen sky, where the harvest moon rose large and yellow over the hills to his left, and shed a strange mystical light that blended in a kind of chord with the dying daylight. It was at times like that when the air was fragrant with the scent of dying leaves, with perhaps a touch of frost in it, and the cottages one by one opened red glowing eyes in the dusk that the boy began to dream of a home of his own and pleasant domestic joys of burning logs on the hearth and lighted candles and a dear slender figure moving about the room he used to rehearse to himself little meetings and partings look at the roofs of the dower house against the primrose sky as he rode up the fields homewards identify her window dark now as she was away and long for Christmas, when she would be back again. The only shadow over these delightful pictures was the uncertainty as to the future. Where, after all, would the home be? For he was a younger son. He thought about James very often. When he came back, would he live at home? Would it all be James's at his father's death? these woods and fields and farms and stately house would it ever come to him and meanwhile where should he and isabel live when the religious difficulty had been surmounted as he had no doubt that it would be sooner or later when he thought of his father now it was with a continually increasing respect he had been inclined to despise him sometimes before as one of a simple and uneventful life but now the red shadow of the law conferred dignity to have been imprisoned in the tower was a patent of nobility adding distinction and gravity to the commonplace something of the glory even rested on hubert himself as he rode and hawked with other catholic boys whose fathers maybe were equally zealous for the faith but less distinguished by suffering for it before anthony went back to cambridge he and hubert went out nearly every day together with or without their hawks anthony was about three years the younger and hubert's additional responsibility for the estate made the younger boy more in awe of him than the difference in their ages warranted besides hubert knew quite as much about sport and had more opportunities for indulging his taste for it there was no heronry at hand besides it was not the breeding time which is the proper season for this particular sport so they did not trouble to ride out to one but the partridges and hares and rabbits that abounded in the maxwell estate gave them plenty of quarries they preferred to go out generally without a falconer a dutchman who had been taken into the service of sir nicholas thirty years before when things had been more prosperous it was less embarrassing so but they would have a lad to carry the cadge and a pony following them to carry the game they added to the excitement of the sport by making it a competition between their birds and flying them one after another or sometimes at the same quarry as in coursing but this often led to the birds crabbing anthony's peregrine eliza was almost unapproachable and the lad was the more proud of her as he had made her himself as an ayas or young falcon captured as a nestling but on the other hand hubert's goshawk margaret a fiery little creature named inappropriately enough after his tranquil aunt as a rule did better than anthony's isabel and brought the scores level again 
there was one superb day that survived long in anthony's memory and conversation when he had done exceptionally well when eliza had surpassed herself and even isabel had acquitted herself with credit it was one of those glorious days of wind and sun that occasionally fall in early october with a pale turquoise sky overhead an air that seems to sparkle and intoxicate like wine they went out together after dinner about noon their ponies and spaniels danced with the joy of life lady maxwell cried to them from the north terrace to be careful and pointed out to mr norris who had dined with them what a graceful seat hubert had and then added politely but as an obvious afterthought that anthony seemed to manage his pony with great address the boys turned off through the village and soon got on to high ground to the west of the village and all among the stubble and mustard with tracts of rich sunlit country of meadows and russet woodland below them on every side then the sport began it seemed as if eliza could not make a mistake there rose a solitary partridge forty yards away with a whirl of wings the coveys were being well broken up by now anthony unhooded his bird and cast off with the falconer's cry hoo ha 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 and up soared eliza with the tinkle of bells on great strokes of those mighty wings up up behind the partridge that fled low down the wind for his life the two ponies were put to the gallop as the peregrine began to stoop and then down like a plummet she fell with closed wings raked the quarry with her talons as she passed recovered herself and as anthony came up holding out the tabor stick returned to him and was hooded and leashed again and sat there on his gloved wrist with wet claws just shivering slightly from her nerves like the aristocrat she was while her master stroked her ashy back and the boy picked up the quarry admiring the deep rent before he threw it into the pannier then hubert had the next turn but his falcon missed his first stoop and did not strike the quarry till the second attempt thus scoring one to anthony's account then the peregrines were put back on the cadge as the boys got near to a wide meadow in a hollow where the rabbits used to feed and the goshawks margaret and isabel were taken each in turn sitting unhooded on her master's wrist while they all watched the long thin grass for the quick movement that marked the passage of a rabbit and then in a moment the bird was cast off the goshawk would rise just high enough to see the quarry in the grass then fly straight with arched wings and pounces stretched out as she came over the quarry then striking him between the shoulders would close with him and her master would come up and take her off throw the rabbit to the game carrier and the other would have the next attempt and so they went on for three or four hours encouraging their birds whooping the death of the quarry watching with all the sportsman's keenness the soaring and stooping of the peregrines the raking off of the goshawks listening to the thrilling tinkle of the bells and taking back their birds to sit triumphant and complacent on their master's wrist when the quarry had been fairly struck and furious and sullen when it had eluded them two or three times till their breath left them in the dizzy rushes and they cancelleered or even returned disheartened and would fly no more till they had forgotten till at last the shadows grew long and the game more wary and the hawks and ponies tired and the boys put up the birds on the cadge and leashed them to it securely and jogged slowly homewards together up the valley road that led to the village talking in technical terms of how the merlin's feather must be imped to-morrow and of the relative merits of the varvels or little silver rings at the end of the jesses through which the leash ran and the dutch swivel that squire blackett always used as they got nearer home and the red roofs of the dower house began to glow in the ruddy sunlight above the meadows hubert began to shift the conversation round to isabel and inquire when she was coming home anthony was rather bored at this turn of the talk but thought she would be back by christmas at the latest and said that she was at northampton and had hubert ever seen such courage as eliza's but hubert would not be put off but led the talk back again to the girl and at last told anthony under promise of secrecy 
that he was fond of isabel and wished to make her his wife and oh did anthony think she cared really for him anthony stared and wondered and had no opinion at all on the subject but presently fell in love with the idea that hubert should be his brother-in-law and go hawking with him every day and he added a private romance of his own in which he and mary corbett should be at the dower house with hubert and isabel at the hall while the elders his own father sir nicholas mr james lady maxwell and mistress torridon had all taken up submissive and complacent attitudes in the middle distance he was so pensive that evening that his father asked him at supper whether he had not had a good day which diverted his thoughts from mistress corbett and led him away from sentiment on a stream of his own talk with long backwaters of description of this and that stoop and of exactly the points in which he thought the maxwell's falconer had failed in the training of hubert's jane hubert found a long letter waiting from his father which lady maxwell gave him to read with messages to himself in it about the estate which brought him down again from the treading of rosy cloud castles with a phantom isabel whither his hawks and the shouting wind in the happy day had wafted him down to questions of barns and farm servants and the sober realities of harvest End of chapter ten